Hey, what's up, Internet? It's your soul here, and today is 9-11, the anniversary of the 9-11 Twin Tower Pentagon attack, which began so many illegal conflicts and massive amounts of death and suffering around the world in various places for various reasons, but all basically often tied back to this amazing collage of events and, in my opinion, a vast amount of misdirection. So, what I've got you looking at here is the 9-11 Catalyst at Eureka.org, which is the social network I run, and that's aligned towards healing, balancing, and evolving. So, in other words, it's pro-truth, pro-freedom, and pro-learning. And Catalysts are a bit like Pinterest, if you've ever used that site. Essentially, they are a way of building a page which combines together lots of different elements. What I've got mostly on this page is a collection of videos which are already on Eureka in various different places, and I've pointed them all to this page. So when I come into this page, I can add them all and easily drag them around and reorder them. And basically, it's a little bit like making my own documentary in a way, except for it's much quicker. I don't have to actually go to the trouble of making a documentary. I can just take all the various sources I'm interested in and put them on one page. So I can actually point people to come and look at this if they're interested in doing their own research. And yet, you know, there's probably 24 hours worth of material on this page versus two hours that there would be if I made a documentary. But at the end of the day, there's a lot more information and source information in here than I could really put in a documentary. And I'm going to show you through here briefly some of the videos that are on this page, just so you understand what's on here. There's a lot of material from James Corbett, who I really do respect as a researcher and journalist. And he has put many videos together over the years relating to 9-11 entire series actually his current series is called 9-11 whistleblowers and he's put a few out of different people who most people will have never heard of even as a researcher of 9-11 some of them i hadn't really heard of i didn't know too much about until uh, he published his work on them he also put this full-length documentary together 9-11 trillions follow the money which is all very interesting it was all about the money side of what went on behind the scenes surrounding 9-11 the trades that took place in deutsche bank uh, which basically were proven to be uh, evidence that whoever made those trades had foreknowledge of the event. And I don't think they ever actually tracked down who those trades were made by fully. Um, the government basically said, don't look into it. So you've got G General Wesley Clark here, an American general. This is a short video. Let's just have a listen to him. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz, I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me in. He said, sir, you got to come in. You got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision. We're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later. And by that time, we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. Right, so... You know, there's a lot of guesswork there, wasn't there, from him and from the person he was talking about. They didn't really know what was going on. He wouldn't, unless he did a huge amount of digging around. Ultimately, this is a massive subject that, with a lot of details that are being hidden. So there's no real way for you to know really what's happening, unless you really dive deeply into this. And thankfully, many people have. And that's really the point of this catalyst, is to bring evidence together from many different places. So the countries that you listed there, you know, in the years following that, many of them were attacked, if not all of them, I think most of them. Um, under various different pretenses. So William Rodriguez, he was a he was basically a, a worker in the towers, and he was one of five people to have the master key to the buildings. And he was 
herald, heralded as a hero by many news media sources, and he met the president and so on because he saved many people's lives and you know was really working hard to do that. And what James Corbett highlights in this video is that from day one after 9-11, he was saying that the story that everyone else was saying or the mainstream media were saying about what happened was false. He was saying that there was a massive explosion underground in the basement before the plane even hit the towers. And that was the first thing he knew about what was going on. And it blew him off, the, off his feet and lots of other people. And he describes that as being caused by an explosion that happened beneath them, not above them. And he's gone on many times publicly telling this story, never changed his story. He, he fully openly states the government are lying. And, you know, he's fully into the concept that this was uh, a, a demolition that was done deliberately inside and made to look like a terrorist event. Definitely recommend listening to William Rodriguez. Michael Springman is another one who's definitely worth listening to. He worked in a Middle Eastern embassy, as I recall, and his job was essentially approving visas for people coming from those areas into America. And as it turned out, of the alleged hijackers of the planes, 12 or so of them had their visas issued by the same office. And that was his office, but it was done after he left. He wrote a book uh, on this subject, and he's given many interviews and talks about how he found it strange while he was working in that job that he was getting a lot of pressure to approve certain people for visas to come into America who shouldn't have been approved based on their background. For example, they weren't tied closely enough to the country of origin, so they were a risk that they might try and stay in America, that kind of thing. And he was getting a lot of pressure put on him by various people to just kind of skip over the rules and allow these people in anyway. And he found it odd. He eventually got booted from that job. And he later found out that he was one of only a small number of people in that office that weren't working for the CIA. And he suddenly realized, oh, I was the patsy. So basically he was being asked to commit fraud and crime, essentially, uh, for the CIA without the CIA telling him that that's why they're asking him to do it. And that was because if it ever came to light what happened, he would take the blame for it, not the CIA. So he went around trying to explain this and basically saying that um, the evidence has shown since that obviously, well, some of those people allegedly went on to go and be involved in this event in some way, but uh, on 9-11. But the point was that there were CIA intelligence operations involved with uh, allowing these people into the country, two of which from the 9-11 event were actually on uh, a watch list in America as Al-Qaeda agents. And yet they were allowed in, and he was um, he he wasn't the person actually signed that document. But but when they discovered who did sign the documents, it was a female from America. It was her first job outside out of university, and she, then she retired not long afterwards. I mean, she didn't even have enough time to have a career. So somehow, <laughs> I don't know what she was doing retiring. It sounds like she had got a nice payout from somewhere. But uh, he spoke to her, and there's just a whole. It's just one of the many trails of information that spring out from this nine uh, eleven investigation by the people ultimately not by governments because they're never going to really probably likely do this in enough depth because they're going to be implicated themselves um so this is a video that i uploaded recently as well which is on the recent release of a four-year academic study from alaska fairbanks university by professor leroy holsey which essentially demonstrates according to him that the mathematics and physics involved in the collapse of world trade center building seven the third tower to come down that wasn't hit by a plane uh, that that tower could not have come down according, uh, caused by office fires, which was the claim of the US government's report. It basically shows how that's impossible, and effectively it would have had to have been something akin to a uh, controlled demolition for that to happen. And he doesn't use those words, controlled de demolition. He basically just says there's no way for the tower to come down as it did without all of the internal and external supports being removed simultaneously within one second, which you know ultimately pretty much means it had to be a controlled demolition. Come back to Building 7 in a second. Uh, so this is Kate Jenkins, another one of uh, James Corbett's whistleblowers. She was an EPA professor, as I recall, a specialist in toxicology and human health. And she was going around from day one pretty much stating that the government's position that the dust from the World Trade Center towers was completely safe was a lie. And as it turns out, we've since found out publicly that it contained large amounts of asbestos and other toxic chemicals. Many people have died of cancer and illnesses related to, the, to working on the tower site, saving lives and clearing it up. And there was no need for them to. Basically, they could have just had proper protection and you know, probably would have stood a much better chance of coming out of that healthy. And she spent a lot of time blowing the whistle on this and basically got a lot of flack. Uh, she got sacked. I think 
She was also involved as a whistleblower in a previous case with the EPA as well and got reinstated through the courts. And she went through the whole thing again with 9-11. Um, definitely a very interesting story to pay attention to. This is a video, it's another short one, uh, with two guys who actually created the 9-11 Commission report, the NIST report, as I understand, uh, stating afterwards that they were set up to fail and didn't have enough money or resources to do the study properly. So literally, you know, people, people say that, some people have said, well, if this was an inside job, too many people would know about it, people would be talking. But there's a long list of people here who are there or on the inside who are talking. And that's the point James Corbis makes. And, you know, it's very, very true. Uh, you can see this is another video that I made recently, which is worth checking out, which shows uh, the flashes that you can see from inside World Trade Center 7 shortly before it comes down, which look very much like demolition charges going off. Uh, there's also video of Larry Silverstein, the leaseholder of the building, stating at that time, that the fire department made the decision to pull Building 7, which is in complete contradiction to the government's version of events which said that office fires brought the tower down. And in reality, there's no way for a fire department to pull a building like that down unless they had pre-planted demolition charges. Um, so th there's so many lies, overlaying lies in this, that I find it absurd that anybody at this point who's looked into this can even dare to say that the official story is correct. Uh, this is Kevin Ryan, another whistleblower. He worked at a laboratory that was a private company, as I understand, that was part of the uh, process of safety checking appliances and materials for the US government. And their company actually were tasked with the safety checks on the steel for the World Trade Center. And his boss basically said uh, at a speech that he overheard, oh, I'm, you know, we should be proud that the tower stood for as long as they did. You know, that was the result of our diligent work kind of thing. But the towers only stood for about 55 minutes. And they were meant to stand, as I understand it, for about two hours at least, according to their safety standards, which means that actually they, something went terribly wrong. And so this guy, Kevin Ryan, kept you know, asking people, asking his boss, asking various different people to help him understand what really what happened and, and you know, why, why there were these discrepancies. And eventually he was kicked out as well. Here we have a video from the Israeli uh, leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, and I'll just let him speak for himself. Well, I was getting this question in the, 19, uh, in the 1990s, and uh, I said that the West really doesn't understand militant Islam. So I wrote a book in 1995, and I said that if, it, if the West doesn't wake up to the suicidal nature of militant Islam, the next thing you'll see uh, is uh, the militant Islam is bringing down the World Trade Center. Right, so he actually, <laughs> he actually wrote a book before the events of 9-11 and publicly stated that militant Islam was going to bring down the World Trade Center. Why would he say that? Why would you conclude that? Of all the things you could predict, why would you predict that? Seems a little bit of a strange thing to predict to me. So, here's a video of Dr. Leroy Halsey giving a talk. This was from a few years ago while he was partway through the study that only finished recently. These are a little bit out there for some people, but I assure you that from what I can understand, the methods used in these videos are legitimate. This is basically a group called the Farsight Institute who use psychic remote viewing uh, using techniques that were originated by the US military uh, for spying and which they've then taken and, and you know, evolved a bit on their own. They did remote viewing sessions of 9-11 and essentially corroborated the story that I'd already figured out, more or less, and other researchers had figured out and said, uh, you know, the planes were taken over by remote control technology, which which was available to Boeing and various different companies at that time. And the buildings were pre-primed primed with uh, explosives and so on. Definitely worth watching as well. That's all available for free, uh, especially if you're new to remote viewing. It's definitely uh, an eye-opening um, approach to learning information, let's say. This video on the left here is one of the most wild videos that I've seen related to 9-11, and you need to see it yourself to really get your head around it. But... Um, you know, this is the kind of thing where the average person who hasn't looked into this and doesn't watch the video, when they hear me say this, they're just going to laugh and call me a conspiracy theory, tinfoil hat wearing lunatic. But, you know, as with everything, if you don't actually look at the evidence of what you're ridiculing, then you are basically the one who deserves to be ridiculed because you don't really know what you're talking about. Um, this this video, yeah, it, it's really eye opening. Essentially, it is showing you that the the film series Back to the Future, which was a big, um, big thing when I was a kid. I remember watching the first one when I was pretty small. Uh, 
it has a theme running all the way through it of symbology relating to 9-11. And for example, the opening scene here begins in the Twin Pines Mall with um, kind of Middle Eastern terrorists coming and shooting at a time when there weren't really that many. I mean, terrorism wasn't a big deal and certainly not Middle Eastern. So I do remember seeing this as a kid and sort of not really relating to it and thinking, you know, that's, these guys look a bit weird. I haven't seen anybody like that before. Um, and he points out that, you know, here on the clock, it's 9-11, upside down, um, on the clock here. And it, you may not remember or may not have seen the Back to, to the Future series, but ultimately it's about time travel and about different timelines and how events in the present moment can change future timelines and that kind of thing. And one of the plots to this first movie is that changes they make basically along the in the past affect the future and this twin pines mall later becomes the lone pine mall so in the second um timeline it becomes the lone mine so two towers become one ultimately and this is a a pattern which you see rep repeated often in uh occult symbology as well um freemasonry and so on and they point out here that in one of the scenes i believe this is in the second movie i'm not 100 percent sure uh there's a scene where they're in this kind of, they're in the future what they call the future and they have this window that's actually a screen, uh, which allows you to, you know, you think you're looking at a window, but actually it's a TV screen. At the time when this movie came out, that was kind of futuristic because we didn't have flat screens or anything like that. And there's a scene here where you see the Twin Towers. And one of the main characters is coming upside down. It's kind of a, scene, a bit of a weird joke in the movie. He's using this machine, he says, that's sort of gone wrong and it's supposed to make him hover or something like that. And he's ended up, he has to move around upside down because he can't figure out how to fix it. Quite out of place actually that joke for the rest of the movie it's not really that kind of movie with goofy jokes like that as such but they point out in this video that if you view that window from his perspective obviously it's upside down and there's a scene there's a moment in this where the screen flickers and the actual towers move and from his perspective the towers go down basically it's a bit of a sort of hidden symbology thing which on its own you would say well that's a bit of a stretch but if you keep watching this video, you'll see that there are countless other examples of things connecting 9-11 to this movie. There we go. So fire trails, and you've got this bar here on the side, which has got 9 as the logo. So you've got 9-1-1. And there's lots and lots and lots of connections like that in here that tie in Back to the Future to 9-11. But one of the most mind-blowing things, and the thing that really seals it in a way, this connection, is that the creator of that movie, I believe is the producer, Michael Zemeckis, went on later on to create a movie based around the Twin Towers. And there's a scene in one of the Back to Future movies where uh, Marty and the Doc, who are the two main characters, are talking, and he basically says, what does it mean? And then uh, I think it's Marty shouts out, you'll find out in 30 years! And then zooms off. And so 30 years after Back to the Future was made, this other movie was made about 9-11 by the same producer. The character wears almost the same clothes. And the movie is a recreation of the story of the guy who did a high wire walk between the two towers. And I haven't actually seen that movie. I would like to see it. I probably should watch it at some point. Um, but, you know, that to me, again, is another synchronicity that's too obvious for me to miss. Now, I don't fully understand what's happening here. Is it that the obvious is true? and that the producer of this film was part of a group who had foreknowledge of 9-11 and for some reason was trying to prime us with the idea of this happening or just show off to his friends in a way that he thought no one would notice. I don't know, like some sort of status symbol to the world, I'm, I'm God kind of thing. It could also be an innocent thing where he's just unusually psychic or something like that and in the creative flow of his own creativity somehow was channeling this event before it happened. You know, I can't answer that. I don't know enough about it. But I definitely recommend watching this video. It's, you know, even the most closed-minded person will have a hard time um, talking their way out of that, I think. Uh, but there's much better evidence than that anyway. You've got this video here talking about the New Pearl, New Pearl Harbor, which is very long. It's a three-part thing, uh, really in-depth. And it really shows you how the project for the New American Century, these created by these very right-wing American politicians, power mongers, basically war hawks uh they talk about essentially saying that you know without having a new pearl harbor they wouldn't be able to pull through their their chosen policies and obviously pearl harbor was a time when america was attacked by the japanese 
that brought them into World War Two. And effectively, he's kind of saying in that in that document that the American people won't get behind war and conflict and, and power moves in the way they want them to unless America's attacked, pretty much. Uh, and then that t- these same people were very much intimately involved in the whole event of 9/11. Uh, Rebecca Roth was a is a well she's an ex uh, airline stewardess and she basically highlighted many of the flaws and technical impossibilities relating to the evidence provided from the planes involved and flights and calls that were made from the planes not being possible at the altitude and so on uh, also worth listening to got more videos here from James Corbett so this is the 9/11 suspects the dancing Israelis. This was a group of Israelis who were seen filming the Twin Towers at the time of the attack and seen cheering as the the towers exploded. Um, A lady who saw them doing this called the police and uh, I believe they were arrested along with many other agents, as I understand it, Israeli agents around that time and leading up to 9-11 as well. Uh, And they were got basically just let off and sent back to Israel. And then there's footage of at least, I think, two or three of them on, on a chat show in Israel basically saying we were there to film the event. He openly said that, and I can't really see how you can interpret that in any way other than that they knew it was going to happen. Uh, Robert Baer is a smaller case here. He was basically a CIA case officer who was well known on the TV in America for a few years. He was like their go-to guy for being a CIA spokesperson kind of thing. Last thing I would leave you with is National Reconnaissance Office was running a, a drill, a plane crash into their building, and you know their staff by DOD. I and know CIA, that right? I know the guy that went into his broker in San Diego and, and said, "Cash me out, it's going down tomorrow." Really? Yeah. That tells us something. Wow. Yeah. That tells us something. Well, his brother worked in the White House. And there we go. When you say that- so there you go. You've got a stand-up, all-American CIA hero telling you that he knew a guy who brother worked for the White House who went into his broker and said, cash me out, I'm selling out, it's going down tomorrow. So either he's just joking in a most ridiculous and unprofessional way, or he's being honest and he's saying, you know, I knew a guy who knew that 9-11 was going to happen in the White House, and the White House knew in advance too. This is Christine Todd Todd Whitman. Um, She is a woman related to the uh, previous whistleblower that I mentioned here. Uh, Kate Jenkins, because she was the uh, government representative telling everyone that it was safe at 9-11, that there was no problem uh, with the air health and so on. So as you can see, we're only halfway down the page here, and there's many, many, many more videos, and I'm going to show you all the way through to the bottom briefly. Uh, So here we've got Susan Lindau as a CIA asset. This is a very interesting story. Almost nobody seems to have heard of her. She's definitely somebody people should be listening to. Uh, She was actually, as I recall, tasked with being part of the peace group that was in talked with Iraq to try to get them to make changes and provide evidence and so on that they were asking for at the time. And she basically found that the US government was not playing fair and was lying and misleading people. And it's a long story, but at the end of at the end of all of that, she actually got put in a in prison by the American government and drugged and tried they basically tried to silence her. And it was only due to the sanity of a judge who for some reason wasn't as corrupt as the other people that put her there, who actually let her out. And she then went on to go and tell the world. And, you know, if if that hadn't happened, if that one judge hadn't stood up for her, she, her whole story would have been lost and she probably would have died in prison. Um, you know, another massive story that you'll never hear on the mainstream. This is an interesting video. There's a whole bunch of psychologists here basically going through the psychology of denial and how um, People who have been lied to en masse by the government essentially find it very difficult to um, accept alternative versions of reality, even when the evidence is massive that they need to. They will continue denying the truth. Very interesting indeed. Um, this lady here worked, was in the Pentagon working uh, on that day and just points out, she points out a few interesting things. One of the things she says is that she never saw a plane at the Pentagon. And there's a lot of evidence that what actually hit the Pentagon that day was a, a missile. And the area of the Pentagon that got hit had just been reinforced just to survive an exact strike of the kind that happened that day. Um, The plane allegedly that hit the Pentagon would have had to have pulled off an almost impossible corkscrew turn and manoeuvre that even fighter pilots have gone on record saying that they don't even think they could pull off themselves, uh, let alone, you know, uh, basically barely able to fly hijacker from, you know, the Middle East. Uh, you know, it's ridiculous, really, when you when you think of all this stuff together. How did those planes even reach the Pentagon? Where was NORAD? Where were the fighter pilots ready, or the missile defences ready to shoot the plane down? Nothing happened at all. They launched nothing. 
uh, that's a whole massive story in itself. If you click through these videos, you, you'll you'll get to all of that information as well. Here's footage um, from the actual Pentagon. At the time of 9-11, of they actually released only two or three frames from this camera, which just so showed an explosion pretty much. And some years later, someone actually got hold of more footage from that camera. I don't really, I've never heard it explained why they wouldn't release this originally, because there's no reason not to, I don't think, except for in one frame, you can see, if I full screen this, you can see that there's the object, basically. I've paused it now. There's the object that they say was an airliner coming in and hitting, hitting the pen, Pentagon. Now, you can't really tell from that uh, frame that that really is a plane, but. And there you go, the next frame we've got is an explosion. So, you know, that's not evidence of a plane, it's evidence of something. Uh, and people say it's a missile, some people say it's a plane. To me, I don't think that looks big enough to be a plane, personally. I mean, it would be quite a big missile if it was a missile, but, uh, you know, it doesn't look like a plane to me, that's all I'm going to say. All of the footage that covered that event was confiscated by the government and their agents. And this is all that was ever released. They even took footage from um, local businesses and so on that's never been released. So you've got a question why that is. This is a video which I, for years, was showing lots of people. This was the ultimate for quite a while for me. This this really does explain so many different things that you almost never hear about relating to the Carlyle Group, Kroll, various different companies, the finance involved, um, deals that were being done behind the scenes. I mean, really, you need to, every single one of these, you need to watch for yourself, to be honest. There's just way too much for me to explain or even remember all the details of in there. It's just massive. Uh, we have here uh, the ex-Canadian Minister of Defence, uh, which we can listen to here briefly. The Iron Veil of Secrecy is now nearing the end of its seventh decade. In fact, it was the cornerstone lie of what was to become a cult of lying and disinformation that is still United States policy today, 68 years later. So he covers, I'm, it's been a while since I watched that video, but he's essentially describing how he knows that 9-11 uh, was a lie perpetrated by the US government. This is a very interesting video of John Kerry. Um, we just, just literally the other day, um, evidence has been provided that John Kerry was a visitor to Jeffrey Epstein's mansion. Uh, with a photo released from the housekeepers of Jeffrey Epstein um, showing them with him. In this video, he actually says uh, that the Building 7 was, he believes, brought down by the fire, de fire department, which basically means that demolitions were involved because there's no other possible way for that to be done. So let's just have a listen to that. Also, a question I have for you. Um, World Trade Center 7 was brought down... Um, on September 11th at 5:20 in the in the evening, uh, the leaseholder of the World Trade Center complex, Larry Silverstein, gave a uh, public interview on PBS in 2002, and he said that they pulled that building, which is a demolition term for intentionally bringing down a building. This man made over five billion dollars from those buildings' destruction, and I want to know if there was ever a formal investigation into Larry Silverstein, the leaseholder of the World Trade Center complex, and his ties to this entire event. I don't believe there's been a formal investigation. I haven't heard that. I don't know that. I do know that uh, they, that, that wall, I remember, was, was in danger, and I think that they made a decision based on the danger that it had of destroying other things, that they did it in a controlled fashion. So that's a bit debatable. It sounds like he doesn't really know what he's talking about. He's just making stuff up. But um, he says there was a wall that was looking dodgy, so they had to do something to um, prevent damage to other buildings. So the whoever was there on the ground took steps to make that happen. That's not really... <laughs> uh, I, I don't really know what he's talking about there, but it, it does sound a bit like he's saying... You know, if you took him literally what he's saying, he's saying that World Trade Center 7 was brought down deliberately. Um, you know, not the best evidence, but certainly um, kind of odd to hear him saying that, let's say. Uh, you've got footage here and seismic readings, as I recall, or recordings of explosions being heard uh, in advance of World Trade Center 7 coming down. There are similar recordings available for the other towers as well. Um, so, yeah, this is Ken O'Keefe, a uh, slightly controversial figure, but basically he goes on a rampage here explaining how... Um, 
9-11 was an inside job by uh, America and Israel, essentially. Uh, this is an interesting one. So this is uh, Aaron Russo, who was a film producer. He made the um, famous comedy Trading Places, amongst other things. And he says in this interview that he made friends with Nick Rockefeller and over the years. And at some point, he told him that... Uh, Rockefeller told him that basically before the invasion of Iraq and 9-11 and all this stuff happened, he said to him, oh, you're going to see a big event happening. There's going to be wars and we're going to be searching for these people in caves. Um, it's going to be this sort of endless war on terror and none of it's going to be real. We're, we're going to have fabricated it all. Uh, and, you know, he said this, you know, in this interview in detail and uh, he died not long afterwards. This is Dmitry Kalasov, a US, uh, Russian nuclear arsenal specialist. Goes into massive detail over many hours explaining how uh, the American government had developed novel forms of nuclear devices over the years. There's a video actually I have um, from the 1960s, I believe, called, uh, there's a promotional video from them uh, describing Operation Plowshare, which was essentially their use of nuclear technology to achieve unusual goals such as demolition or making rivers, uh, removing mountains, things like that. They were trying to sell nuclear technology in ways that weren't weapons, ultimately. And he says that at that time, they, uh, because the World Trade Center buildings were so massive, in order to build a tower like that in New York, the regulations said that you had to have a way of demolishing the building if you needed to in the future. And given that these were so massive and unprecedented, they didn't really know how to do that. So they actually installed, he says, nuclear de uh, demolition devices underground in these tunnels to ensure that they could bring the towers down if needed in the future. And he says that's how the towers were turned into vapour or dust, dustified. Um, and that picture behind them is of a granite missile, which he says was uh, basically stolen from one of the nuclear Russian, Russian nuclear submarines, the Kursk, I think it was, that sank off uh, Norway a while ago, a few years ago. Uh, he says they took a whoever it was, whichever team it was, basically, he says, stole a, a granite nuclear missile and launched that against the Pentagon. That's his version, you know, it's just something to pay attention to. So, yeah, there's there's so much more in here. Um, just trying to pick out a few key points. Lots to do with Israel, you know, many, many strong ties to Israel and people in the American government who, with strong ties to Israel as well. Um, here's another video relating to uh, the 7-7 London bombings, which happened, you know, not long after. And in this video, he says, we did it. Um, urban, urban moving systems was uh, discovered in a van, white van that had checked positive for carrying explosives. So this is another side of the story. Urban Moving Systems was a company in, a, in New York, I believe it was, uh, operated, as I recall, by uh, Israeli citizens nationals let's say um and their vehicle was stopped and found to be uh carrying explosives at that time and there's a whole trail of evidence that that comes off of that and they were caught videotaping the collapse from their van uh, in liberty You know, it, it just seems like they must have had prior knowledge of not involvement. They could have had prior knowledge. They could have had prior knowledge. And it's easy to put a truck bomb as we did, it, as happened in London uh, and happens in Iraq or Israel on a, on a weekly basis. It's easy to put a truck bomb as we did, it, as happened in London. There's been a few slips like that that people have made as well. Uh, pretty interesting. So here we've got Rudy Dent, who was a New York firefighter, and he's been speaking out for a while, I think, uh, as a whistleblower on, on what really happened in 9-11. There's many people working for uh, fire services, particularly since they lost so many people there who have spoken out in the government. I don't remember seeing or hearing too many police people speaking out uh, and not many military people either, which, you know, could be relevant. Uh, this... Last video at the bottom here. There's many more videos I could put on this page, but, you know, you can't keep going forever. Uh, but this last video is from Barbara Honegger, who was uh, basically part of the Reagan administration and worked in the Pentagon and 
White House, I believe, for um, many years for different reasons in different jobs. And she wrote a book and went on a whole journey as a whistleblower, basically pointing out that the evidence from the day doesn't add up. And, uh, you know, the evidence from the Pentagon in particular very much points to there not being a plane that struck the Pentagon, which would tie in with the idea that it was actually a missile. So, you know, it's difficult when we look at all of these things to try and pin down in less than about eight hours worth of material uh, information that a newcomer to this might walk away and say, oh, it was definitely, definitely a lie, because you actually have to take your time to go and listen to the people and look at the evidence and realise how all of this has been put together and how the deceptions have been woven. Uh, you know, I can't really do the best job here without, as I said, without producing my own documentary. So the next best thing is for me to build this page so that you can come and have a look and in your own time work through this material if you haven't seen it already and uh, and put the pieces together for yourself. I highly doubt that anybody who looked at all these videos would be able to walk away and, and think that, you know, the, the version of events told to them by the US government was completely accurate. Let's put it like that. I, I'd, I've never met anybody that has done that. The more we push on this, the closer we'll all get to the truth. And my wish is that we can collectively make decisions which prevent this kind of thing occurring again and that we can stop the violence that's still spiralling to this day as a result of these events. Um, and we can actually shift the feedback loop of human experience away from destruction and towards creativity and benevolence and joy for once, which would be awesome, uh, which is really the natural state of life. And we are very, very far away from that to this day. And the people who have benefited from pushing us out of balance continue to benefit by selling weapons and selling uh, fear and ultimately tricking people to into giving away their freedom and, and liberty for an imagined security, which they never actually get. So as always, if you've liked this video, then please do give me a like, give me a, an upvote on Steam reblog, re-steam, share it along with your friends on whichever social networks you're on. Uh, you know, ultimately, you're not going to get this information from the mainstream TV or radio sources. Only now are some of them starting to give some airplay to these subjects. I think uh, Leroy Halsey's four-year academic study maybe got some exposure in one or two mainstream sources, but not many. And, you know, generally speaking, they're not going to show you this information ever. It's not you're just not going to see it. So it's up to us, isn't it, to to be diligent and do our own research and pass this on. So please do. And as always, leave any comments you have underneath this wherever you see it. And until next time, peace. <laughs>